Okay, welcome everyone to the Hadley Historical Society. I'm Rosalie Weinberg, and tonight we're going to have a presentation about talking to the dead in Massachusetts. Who, what, where, why, when. And we're really pleased to have back one of our favorite speakers from last year, Robert Cox. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks. This is a bit different. Last time I was here, I talked about pie. Pies. Oh, pies. There is nothing edible in this talk whatsoever, I can guarantee you. But uh, this comes out of work I did for my dissertation. I just happened to accidentally bring a copy of the book. It literally was accidental. Um, but to give you a, a sense of what, it, what I want to talk about tonight is if, if you were sitting in this room 150 years ago, and probably walked up and down the common here, gone over to Amherst, walked up and down the common there, someone you ran into would have been interested in spiritualism. And 1850s, 1860s are in some ways the heyday of spiritualism. Massachusetts was one of the centers of spiritualism. It wasn't the f origin of the movement, which really over in New York State, a little bit further west of here, almost due west of here. But Massachusetts took up spiritualism early and very fervently, and Massachusetts has retained an interest in spiritualism to this day. So what I want to do is sort of talk through what spiritualism is about and what it meant to the people at the time, which is really my, the heart of my interest, and what I, I think we can learn from thinking about the way spiritualists thought about spiritualism in the 19th century. I've just begun working on spiritualism after the Second World War. Uh, when I started my project, I decided I didn't want to write on anyone who had any chance of still being alive, uh, because they have a chance to complain about what you say about them. And I figured if I write about the 19th century and I write about spirits, I'm doubly dead. So uh, it, it worked in that I have, until recently, never spoken to anyone alive about, about this project. But um, spiritualism is a very concrete, specific thing. People will often, when they say spiritualism, think generally about religious, spirit, uh, uh, religious spirituality. It works. Uh, my system works. The high tech works. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, spirituality is sort of at a center of spiritualism in the 19th century. It isn't specifically a religious movement, but is often thought of as a religious movement. And if you study 19th century history at all, you learn very early on that the early half, the first half of the 19th century is a time that's usually referred to as the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening goes back into the 1740s and took place in large part here in Northampton, among other places. Northampton is one of the centers. The Second Great Awakening is this period of very intense religious revivals that last from about 1800 into the 1840s or 50s. And it's a period of time marked by these great public meetings, like depicted here, where you had evangelical preachers roaming the countryside, converting whole towns at a time. It happened here in Western Mass. It happened especially in upstate New York. It happened in Kentucky and Tennessee. It happened all over the country. These, this movement, which really is usually dated the first great mass revival down in Kentucky, but within years it was all over the country. And you had in any one town, you would have a, uni uh, a, a universalist minister coming through who would convert the town. A Methodist would follow. The Presbyterians would come after that. You get one denomination after another coming and lighting souls on fire in these districts. And the up upstate New York became so heavily proselytized, they called it the burned over district. Because it had been burned over by these religious fires one after another, time after time. Now, out of this great religious awakening in the 1830s, 1840s especially, we get two or three great American religions coming out. One is the Mormons, 1830 or so, upstate New York. They are not evangelical in the same sense as the Presbyterians and the Methodists, but they come out of this as a, non, it's a new American religion that comes out of this religious hothouse. Uh, second, you have the Seventh-day Adventists who come out. They come out of the Millerites who, in the 1840s, believed that the Second Coming was coming. All they had to do was climb on top of a hill, music would play, and suddenly shut <laughs> off, and everyone would be transported to heaven. Uh, notice how I fit that in? Uh, yeah, very good. Uh, 
the third great movement to come out of this Great Awakening, the third great American movement, is the Spiritualist movement. And it's very different. So the Spiritualist movement is usually dated to March 31st, 1848. That's a very specific date. But it comes out of something more complicated. And I'll talk about it a little bit. But that March 31st, 1848 date relates to these three women that you see here. Kate, Margaret, Fox are the, the two younger girls with their older sister, Leah, uh, standing above them. And Kate and Margaret Fox were in their early teens in 1848. And the story goes that they were living in, in this very small home. The home is almost a little bit larger than this room, a tiny bit larger. And the Fox family lived there. The basement, uh, the foundation of that house is still exists in the town of Hydesville, which is just southeast of Rochester. But according to the stories, they, the Fox sisters all winter had been hearing these knocks, these knocks on the walls and the ceilings and the floors in the house. And sometime in the winter, they determined that if they spoke to the knocks, that they could get a response. Just like that. <laughs> My timing with phones. It's the spirit world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, very much like that. So the fox, the foxes thought this was interesting. Nobody in the family understood what was going on, but it became quite a phenomenon locally. People noticed that something was going on. And then around March 31st, 1848, uh, the Fox sisters discovered that if they asked a question, they could get a telegraphic response. So you could say two knocks for yes, one knock for no, and they asked questions. And in short order, they determined that what they were communicating with was the spirit, and later stories add on to this, but it was the spirit of a traveling salesman who died in the house and who was buried behind a wall in the basement. And according to stories, they later dug up the basement, found nothing, or they found a traveling salesman's pack, depending on which version of the story you heard. But in 1848, this was communicating with the dead. And this was new. This struck people first in town, and then in the area, and then all over the region as being something of interest. And people began to besiege the Fox sisters, saying, if you can communicate with the dead, could you communicate with my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my child, my uncle, some relative, some dear loved one, could you communicate with them? And that became a phenomenon. They discovered a way, telegraphically, of communicating with the dead that opened up a vision of the afterlife for Americans in the late 1840s. It became so popular that Fox sisters, these little country girls, 13, 14 years old, that young teenage girls, were whisked up to Buffalo, or pardon me, to Rochester first, put on stage in the Corinthian Hall there and demonstrate their abilities in front of vast crowds up there. They were tested to see if they were frauds. They had to stand on glass plates to make sure that it wasn't some electrical phenomenon. They were prodded and poked and felt and all sorts of things to determine whether they were fraudulent. They were taken to Buffalo and tested in Buffalo. Uh, in Buffalo, a group of doctors determined that maybe what they were doing was wrapping, uh, sorry, cracking their knuckles in their toes and their ankles and maybe in their knees to produce these sounds. But nobody believed that other than the doctors and the people who were opposed to the spirituals. And very quickly, you see, with spiritualism falls into a pattern very early on. One of the things that the Fox sisters said, not so much the Fox sisters, but their followers said, he said, if you're a Unitarian, if you're a Universalist, if you're a Methodist or a Presbyterian, you have to take the central tenets of your religion on faith. You have to believe that there's a God up there who speaks, uh, who uh, distributes law through Moses or speaks through his son, or who writes a book that you have to believe is divinely inspired. But with spiritualism, our central tenet is that you can communicate with the dead and prove that there is life after death. And all you have to do is experience it yourself and draw your own conclusions. And that was a very, very powerful move. Their opponents felt, first, that they must be frauds. The doctors thought they must be frauds. They couldn't necessarily prove it, but they gave plausible arguments for how they might be 
defrauding the public. Um, there were others who believed that they were real, but what they were doing was channeling natural forces in the universe. Electricity and magnetism especially were thought to be real, or equally real phenomena for the 1840s. They thought it must be all about clairvoyance. Uh, everyone knows clairvoyance and telepathy are real phenomena, and all they're doing is reading the minds of the people that they're communicating with, and that's all. It's nothing to do with dead spirits. Other people thought they were very real but diabolical, that it wasn't the spirits of the living brothers and sisters who purported to be communicating, but angels and devils who were communicating. So this became very popular, and it began spreading. The Fox sisters' communicating method of communicating telegraphically took off and devolved into a variety of different directions. You had table tipping, which you may run into occasionally hear about, where people line their hands around the edge of the table, ask questions, and the table would rise and fall to answer those questions. Uh, we had others, uh, like the great chemist Robert Hare, America's greatest bench chemist of the time, who's uh, rather elderly at the point. But Robert Hare devised a machine that could help a spirit medium communicate and uh, essentially more or less type out messages that came from the world beyond. You had other forms, the planchette, now the Ouija board, uh, was evolved probably a, a decade after the Fox sisters came along. You had people who displayed mysterious forms of energy or light or ma whole manifestations of entire spirits who came along. The, fo the eldest Fox sister, Leia, began, became a materialization medium about 10 years after the Fox sisters first began communicating. This is a photo from the early 20th century with a woman <clears throat> materializing an electronic, uh, electric substance, a plasma substance, depending on who you believe. There were others who uh, communicated through automatic writing. My favorite is a guy named the Spirit Postmaster, James Mansfield, who's from Massachusetts, from Chelsea, Mass, originally. And Mansfield called himself the Spirit Postmaster because he had people write him messages in sealed envelopes. He said, seal them any way you want. Put them under lead, dip them in wax, anything you want so that I can't see the contents with my, my eyes. And I would hold them to my head and read them telepathically and respond accordingly. And Mansfield claims to have uh, responded to letters written in Chinese, responding back in Chinese, or in German, responding in German, or in French, responding in French. Mansfield knew none of those languages. Uh, I've worked a lot on Mansfield. He went to San Francisco in 1862 to 1864 and carried out a practice there, left his wife back here in Massachusetts. And I was very interested in what he was writing to his wife while he was out there. His wife presumably knows him relatively well. And these thick, these thick letter books talk about his practice out there, his spirit practice. And I came away believing that Mansfield, at least, believed what he was doing. He was tested just like the Fox sisters on at least two occasions. In 1858, he was tested by a group of Harvard professors. So, you know, low quality, but they were Harvard, <laughs> Harvard professors tested him. And they determined at the end that they could not determine precisely how he was falsifying his message, how he was cheating, but he must be cheating. In the 1870s, he was tested again, 1877, he was tested down at the University of Pennsylvania, which is the poor man's Harvard, and out there, he was also found to be surely a fraud, but they just couldn't determine exactly how he was, fra he was fraudulent. I came away believing that Mansfield believed what he was doing, because there's one of the early letters in these letter books was written when he was going to San Francisco, off the coast of Mexico. And he wrote to his wife something to the effect. He said, uh, well, my wife, I, I was visited by an angel last night, a spirit last night, who told me to write to you to ask to go visit your aunt because she's in need right now. She needs to see you. Please go and visit her. And it's a very simple statement. But you put it in context. He really believed that a spiritual presence came to him and <clears throat> told him to tell his wife this. So either he's defrauding his wife or he's defrauding himself but he believes it. Now, this was the central question for me when I began the work. I started working on spiritualism because I had read a book by uh, a woman named Ann Brody, who is probably still the most uh, re referenced book on American spiritualism. And her take was that the Fox sisters and everything that follows, this great profusion of mediumship, of communication, 
of people joining in spirit circles took place because it gave people something, something very concrete. And she says it gave people, but it gave women especially something. So in the 1840s, 1850s, women are really barred from speaking publicly on almost any subject. Women were not supposed to be addressing promiscuous crowds, is the word they used. Crowds that had both men and women. Women weren't supposed to be talking about public issues of the day. Women weren't supposed to be speaking with authority. Spirit mediumship, like, the, like we see in the foxes, where the foxes become the vehicle for speaking with the authority of spirits behind them, is very powerful for those women, because this is one of the few times they can speak out. And the way mediumship worked, in most cases, was mediums delivered the messages in a trance. And when they came out of the trance, they couldn't remember what they had said. So it gave you the ability to say whatever you wanted to say publicly, and then deny that you actually said it. And it's a very powerful reading. I, you know, everybody likes to believe this. But I ran into a letter, and I'm going to read part of this, written from a guy named Wendell Newhall, a Massachusetts guy, writing to a friend he had not seen in many, many years, uh, about some experiences he'd had 30 years before, right at the beginning of the spirit movement, when they were out in Eastern Mass up in Rockport, if I remember correctly. And he writes to his friend, uh, Asa Smith, who had written to him before for the first time in many years. He says, Asa, how glad I was when I read your name. The thought that I, in my old age, am remembered by persons with whom I associated 30 years ago stirs up my inner man. And I ask myself, who will speak of me when I pass into the great beyond? You do not misstate anything when you say we lived that winter that you occupied the Hutchison Cottage. It was an association of congenial minds. And what a phenomenon we were witness of, and how futile it is to talk or to tell anyone of the phenomenon we were witness of, and how futile, oh, pardon me, to tell anyone of the phenomena which we know, and with what a power it fastened itself upon me. And when I look back on the evening of the power in fa uh, that pantomime, and think how completely, in spite of all my efforts, they so glibly run my tongue, so peculiar, unsought, and unthought of in that line, it will take more than one skeptic, uh, it says Bob Ingersoll, Robert Ingersoll, who was the greatest skeptic of the day, to get me to say that I don't know of immortality. I emphasize that I do know. Asa, we did live, I can't say fast as that term is used, but there was a fullness, a joyfulness. We reached a point of satisfaction, a demonstrated that the life beyond the grave that the Christian teachers had and were talking so much about, our little company, were cognizant of phenomena that placed it beyond cattle. How we all shook with laughter so strange that a departed spirit, Mr. Rogers, if it was him, should take such a method of demonstration. I don't wonder at the world's incredulity. I don't dare tell folks what I know. I shall get poked at for my pains. And so I keep it secret in my own bosom. Just think, there was I in full possession of all my conscious powers and intelligence foreign to myself, waging my tongue at will, making me exclaim, I have got you, I have got you. Then for one breath I would say, no, you haven't. Then again, seize my tongue against my will and exclaim, yes, I have. I have got you. I have got you. And when I was relieved how I sweat, and to have them use my own tongue and tell me with my own breath that my features, my hair, were like N.P. Rogers. Asa, what, our spiritual status, what was our spiritual status that night? Oh, if we could have had our spiritual sight open that night, what rapturous joy would have been ours. Science has no method of probing this phenomena. They are without crucible and without scalpel. Now, this is 30 years after this experience, the guy is writing with this kind of emotion, this depth, of something that he says has taken him beyond his will and shown him things that he couldn't believe. And when you read Ann Brody, it's very instrumental. It's women who gain power by being able to say things they couldn't in, in daily life. This is a man saying this is a deep, emotional and intellectual experience. There's another aspect of spiritualism that is often not told about, not thought about in this regard. And it comes down to this guy, A.J. Davis, who's from the Hudson River Valley. He's not from Massachusetts, but he traveled to Massachusetts a lot. I think he even lived here for a little while. And A.J. Davis actually predates the, spirit, the, the, the Fox sisters and that rapping, communicating, seance style of spiritualism. The story goes with A.J. Davis that as a young man, 
he was traveling in the Hudson River Valley and stopped off. I think he was working as a shoemaker or something like that. He stopped off in 1845 and he was mesmerized, put under a mesmeric trance. And when he was in that trance state, he imagined that he could see the world all around him, and he could see the spirits of departed people going up to heaven and communicating with heaven. And this is the beginning of what I think is a very powerful philosophical backing for spiritualism that made spiritualism in the 1850s the most popular religion in America, the most rapidly growing religion in America in the 1850s. There are estimates that as many as 3 million to 11 million people believed in spiritualism at the time. And that doesn't sound like very many until you realize that that's perhaps 10% to 30% of the entire population of the country at that time. It's a huge number of people. Not all of them would have called themselves spiritualists, but many of them believed in it. There was no central dogma for spiritualism, except we believe that somehow the living had learned to communicate again with the dead. And Davis said, it's this mesmeric connection. He and a number of other philosophically inclined spirituals called it sympathy. And sympathy is a very old idea that goes back at least into the 1740s, probably into the, well, at least in the 1640s and probably before then. But it became very popular in the 18th century. Sympathy was thought to be an innate natural force that bound people together. Adam Smith, the guy who wrote The Wealth of Nations, believed very powerfully in the, the force of sympathy. He said it's this natural force that makes people feel a little bit of what their neighbors, their friends, their close relatives think and feel. He says, if you want to see sympathy in action, he says, go to a public hanging and look at the crowd. He says, once the victim drops, and begins to sway. If you look at the audience, the audience sways in time with the victim. And he says that is sympathy in action. It's putting this natural connection that we have into this bodily behavior, swaying with people. We tend to feel, if someone feels pain, we feel a bit of that pain. If someone feels joy, we take a little bit of that joy. And that's the sympathetic force. Now, Davis says, Sympathy is a powerful force, and it's something we can act upon. And other spirits have said, we need to act upon it. Because what's going on in the 1850s is we have a country that's falling apart. North and South are dividing into Confederacy and Union. You have the religious denominations threshing in the, all throughout the upper, upper uh, north, well, the northern states and the southern states, taking souls one after another. But if you shift from being a Methodist to a Presbyterian to a Universalist, like many people did, with the frequency of a cheap alarm clock, going back and forth between religions, you may believe in Christianity in a general sense, but what does it do to your sense of stability and being? Shifting all the time from one faith to another. Another of my favorite spirituals, James Martin Peebles, says, when the Universalists, or pardon, when the Presbyterians first came through town, I went to the revival and I was, I was converted. And I believed that the only way to heaven was through the Presbyterian way. Then the Methodists came and they said, we are the only way. And I shifted and I recognized there must be a fall. Then the Universalists came and I became a Universalist. It says, at the end of it, not all could be right, all must be wrong. So it was only when spiritualism came along and we had this possibility of testing it myself that I settled into a belief in what I had. And sympathy was the, the major power. Now, this idea is really rooted in this area already. These are a couple of pieces from more or less our area here that suggest that mesmerism, trance, and all these other things were very much part of the common conversation. On the left, we have somnium, uh, devotional somnium, we can't read devotional about there, which is about a woman named Rachel Baker, who was born in all places, Pelham, Massachusetts. Her father had been one of Shay's rebels, and when Rachel was a young girl, she and her father moved west like so many other people for this reason did, settling in upstate New York. And around 1812 or so, Rachel developed the ability to fall asleep at night, sit bolt upright in her sleep, and preach. I'll come back to her in a second. On the right, we have Jane Ryder, the Springfield somnambulist. 
She was a servant in a respectable home in Springfield. Her day-to-day -day drudgery was the day-to-day -day cleaning up, cooking, and all those sorts of things that you expect a normal servant to do. But one day, her, uh, the household master came down in the middle of the night, pitch dark, and saw Rachel doing her chores in the middle of the night. And he discovered that Rachel could do things like thread a needle in pitch dark. She could set up a table or take down a table, clean dishes, do everything she could normally do during the in dead sleep with no light, nothing. He decided to test this and he got a doctor, uh, Lemuel Belden, to come out and help and there were others involved in this testing. Her. But they blindfolded her, uh, put wrap bandages around the blindfolds and tested her. Can you thread a needle? Yes, she could. She could read, uh, she and other somnambulists like her, there were others in Providence and other places who could read colors through fingertip. You could put a page with several colors and she could, that's red, that's blue, with blindfolded. They could take vis uh, visits by uh, the sort of trance-driven extra bodily travel that we saw with A.J. Davis. Uh, a woman uh, in Providence visited a home in New York City and described what she saw on the table, the books she saw on the bookcases, and the paintings she saw on the wall to the guy who lived in that apartment. And he said she got it all right. So Ryder was ultimately whisked off to a mental hospital in Worcester <laughs> and uh, tested there and they decided they had to uh, deplete her behaviors. So they gave her a, a, a regimen of very harsh medica medicines that did not solve anything, but that slowed her down to the point where she said enough, enough. She was eventually let out uh, uncured. Rachel Baker, meanwhile, in New York, uh, the next slide, is uh, what be, was traveled from upstate New York, taken from upstate New York down to New York City in 1813, 1814, where every night she was put on display. She would go to bed wearing her nightcap. She didn't look like that. Uh, she was a little less ugly than that. But ministers from the local colleges came down and interrogated her, and they recorded the sermons that she delivered when she was asleep. And this sleep preaching, this trance preaching, has a very long history. Rachel Baker is only one person in this. And this sort of fits Anne Brody's thing. These are people displaying extraordinary powers. But it was a mystery to people what caused it. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is my cat who uh, has a a innate connection with me. Uh, so <laughs> she can read my mind. Uh, but the idea that somebody like A.J. Davis or a number of other spirits had was that their abilities are simply this idea that sympathy is natural and powerful and all around us. And you can use these sympathetic waves to connect with people in ways that we can't describe mechanically. There's some innate force that connects us, but we know it through practice. Seeing a, a man hanging on, on the gallows, or seeing a woman who can thread a needle in pitch black, or who can read colors with the tongue. This is all done somehow through these mysterious forces that we can learn to channel. And a number of social reformers in the 1850s took up this cause, especially. Abolitionists, women's rights advocates, and so forth. No, this will work. These, these, are, these are them. Uh, this is uh, a guy on the right, William Denton, who's from, uh, who ended up in Wellesley, uh, became a self-publisher. On the right is Cora Hatch, who's a Massachusetts woman who became a trans preacher early in her life and exemplified a lot of this sort of um, commun communion with spirits. They were both in the reform camp. And they believed spirit, that sympathy is natural, but we can perfect it. We can act on it to solve the problems that we have in society all around us. We have a problem of gender, of women being unequal. Well, we can act on sympathy to bring people together, to heal, to connect, to make people feel with one another. We can solve the problem of race by overcoming, by recognizing that there's a natural connection between people and acting on it, communicating with spirits, communicating with one another, helps resolve these great social tensions we're in the middle of. How powerful sympathy? For them, all you need to do was try it. You say, if you go to a seance, sympathy is so powerful that it can overcome the single most powerful force that we live in our daily lives, and that's the force of death.
Death is the one inevitability. <clears throat> spirits can come back to us because we've established spirit, sympathetic ties in life. And they use those ties to speak to us from beyond the grave. That's how powerful sympathy is. And they really believe this, and they really believe that they needed to act on this. Now, all throughout this area, people took up this cause. We have people like Sojourner Truth, who lived for a while in Northampton, who was a spiritualist. William Lloyd Garrison, the great abolitionist in Boston, was a spiritualist. Frederick Douglass dallied with it for a little bit. Wendell Phillips dallied with it for a little bit. In Southampton, of all places, we have this book by Josiah Gridley, who's just a local guy who read about spiritualism and decided to try it for himself. He didn't get convinced by seeing some magical medium up on a stage. He got convinced by reading and thinking and trying it himself. And he published this book, which is fairly rare, but you can see it's published in Southampton, of all places. There's the Mount Tom Spirit Circle that ran for a little while in the early 1850s. And on and on and on, people trying it for themselves, trying to act upon sympathy here. Now, this led in a lot of different directions. Perhaps the most famous is this direction of spirit photography that you see here, which is also a Massachusetts phenomenon. In the fall of 1862, a guy named William Mumler, who was uh, working for a jeweler in Boston, began experimenting with photography, and he discovered that when he took some photographs of, of people, that he could see a, a sort of ghostly image behind the person. This is, oh, previous. Uh, let me, uh, I'll, re I'll reverse it. Well, you pointed at me, so. I, 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 that was an accident. Was, this is not an auction. <laughs> but this, this, this photograph is actually one that I own uh, myself. It's, it's not, uh, it is a Mumler photograph. But uh, Mumler, started to interpret these ghostly images not as the artifact of poor processing or poor photography but as spirits and he gradually very well very quickly came into uh, asking the sitters do you recognize who this person is and they inevitably said that's my father that's my mother that's my uncle so this hit like wildfire all across the country within months this was everybody was talking about spirit photography in 1862 63 at the time of the Civil War, a lot of people were dying. This seemed to be proof positive that we were capturing spirits on film. We couldn't see them with the eyes, but you could see them on film. And this new technology film became the, the saving grace, they thought. This is a one more photograph showing three spirits hovering around the photograph of a living sitter, uh, which I find really interesting. It's the only one more like it, uh, and I'm, I'm glad I have it. But, when James Mansfield out in California heard about this, he asked, who is this guy Mumler? Can you send me some photographs? So they sent him some photographs and the information on Mumler. He looked at the photos, he thought they were interesting. He started circulating around people in California and the people in California lit up. They said, oh wow, this is proof positive. This is what we've been saying. There's spirits here, we've captured them. Mansfield, the, the spiritual uh, medium himself, eventually concluded that it couldn't be real. And why? He said, Mumler is a guy who's not part of our community. He's not part of our sympathetic circle. He's somebody who's come in from the outside. So he couldn't be showing us sympathy because he himself is not part of our community. So he rejected spirit photography as a real phenomenon. But it became very, very popular in this period of time. So next, this one's next. <laughs> You know the spiritualism continued, and in the 1870s we have the New England Camp Meeting, Spiritualist Camp Meeting Association, pardon me. And this is a photograph of the Independent Order of Scalpers at Lake Pleasant, Mass, just up there in Montague. Uh, the Scalpers building is still there. Uh, this was donated to UMass by Louise Shattuck, who was a, a third generation spirit medium up in Lake Pleasant. Uh, she didn't practice professionally, but she was a medium, she said. But this is a, the scalpers, the Independent Order of Scalpers, are one of these groups that springs up in Lake Pleasant, which was a spirit community, a spirit summer community first, became year-round community to some degree later, and then has devolved into a, a ratty community now. Uh, it's pretty ratty, but it's a nice place to visit. But the, spirit, the spiritualists, very thick there, form this club around the idea of masquerading as Indians. And you'll see... Indians appearing frequently in spiritualist talk in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. 
And by the time 1870s come around, this, this club makes a lot of sense for spiritualists because they viewed our, our interracial brothers as members of our broader spiritualist community. If we act upon it, if we think about them, if we communicate with them, we can form bonds that will overcome the bonds of genocide that we're committing. And spirituals talk about it as genocide at that time. They thought it could solve the problems of race and slavery. But here's what happens. Civil war comes along. In a population of 33 million, we lose half a million people in four short years. And this carnage is one thing. Spirits, you might say, people would flock to spirits because it gave you an opportunity to talk to your son or your father or your brother who died in the war. And to some degree that happened, but not generally. What happened instead is that after the South won the war, and the South lost it militarily, but they won it culturally. After the South won the Civil War, white Americans came together and said, we are a white nation. Black people are not part of our nation. And spiritualists somehow followed suit. To create union again after this huge carnage. What Americans North and South did is said, let's put our differences behind us, let's form a new nation. And when they formed that new nation, white Southerners were unwilling to have the people they had enslaved part of that nation anymore. And it's a harsh reading of what happened, but it's an accurate reading of what happened. I've worked on a group of spirituals of what were called free colored spirituals, African American, mixed race, mostly viewed as African-American in Louisiana before, during, and after the Civil War. And they saw a moment when racial divisions would be overcome. And they were very optimistic after the Union took over New Orleans in 1862. But as soon as the war ended and the revenge from white Southerners came back, starting in 1866 and going to 1877 in New Orleans, very bloody, very violent, and very fierce, very unrelenting, you see them disappearing. These black spirituals sort of close off and they say, we'll look for the afterlife, we're not going to get it in this life. What happens with the Civil War, let's go to the last one, is that these two parts of spiritualism, the Fox Sisters phenomena and A.J. Davis's philosophy, split. And A.J. Davis's philosophy, based on this idea that we could act on, on sympathy and create union, disappeared. And what's left is just the phenomena. So this idea that you can communicate is interesting and fun and draws people in and it's deeply emotional for some, but it lacks the philosophical depth that was there prior to the Civil War. And so spiritualism has continued. It, its peak was probably in the 1860s, 70s or 80s, sometime around there, and it's begun a long, slow decline, come back and forth a little bit here or there. There are still spiritual churches around, there are spirituals who are not parts of churches around. But the level of popularity and the level of respectability across the spectrum from upper class to lower class that we had is now no longer there. If you say you're a spiritualist now, like Wendell Newhall back in the 1880s, you're as likely to be laughed at by, by most Americans as you are to be uh, believed or to be sympathized with. <clears throat> And that's what we've lost, this beautiful idea that Americans could act on this force to create something better was shattered by the Civil War. So that's the uh, sad story. Do you have any questions? I'll, I, I have no more slides, but uh, I do have another cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's my cat. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you have a book out on the term spiritualist, spiritualism. Um, Maybe I heard it wrong in the past, mm -hmm. but is that synonymous with spiritist and spiritism? <laughs> there are technical differences. Spirit, <laughs> spiritualism starts off with just one central tenet. Everyone, a lot of people shared other things, but there's only one thing that everyone shares, and that's that we can communicate with the dead. <laughs> now, out of that, it goes a lot of different directions. Uh, so Christian science, even though Christian scientists don't like to talk about it, is a descendant in some ways of spiritualism, but they've accrued other sets of beliefs that go with it. You'll get theosophists who have a sort of orientalist version where they adapt from Hinduism and other, you know, they go a different direction. New thought is another 
sort of Christianized direction that some people go. And spiritism is another way they go. And oh. if you look around the world today, spiritualism is relatively, you know, I mean, popular is hard to say in the U.S., but where you see it very popular is Brazil. And that's spiritism. That's a French version, French Catholic version of spiritualism that is then adopted and merged with African religions in Brazil to become Brazilian spiritism. And there are other spiritisms elsewhere. So the terms are fuzzy because the, the boundaries are fuzzy between these. So was reincarnation ever kind of incorporated into this? That's a good question. And the answer is yes and no. Uh, so uh, early on, reincarnation is not an element. But reincarnation gets picked up. Uh, theosophists and others who are reading Eastern religions yeah, exactly. begin to adopt elements in a very idiosyncratic way. And there are branches of spiritualism today that the uh, National Spiritual Alliance, I think it is, in Lake Pleasant, which was based in Lake Pleasant, has reincarnation as part of their tenets, but other groups don't. And so you'll see a connection. After the war, after the Second World War that I'm working on right now, one of the biggest phenomena of the 1950s and 1956 is the phenomenon of Bridie Murphy. Mm -hmm. If anybody remembers Bridie Murphy, uh, Bridie Murphy was, uh, there was a woman in Colorado who believed that she had been, uh, lived a previous life as a woman named Bridie Murphy in early 19th, late 18th century Ireland. And there was a fad in the first two thirds of 1956 where Bridie Murphy was recorded on records. Uh, there was a book by Maury Bernstein that came out and sold very, very well. And uh, there were efforts to try to prove her claims to have been, you know, let's go back. She says she lived on this street. Let's look at that street. She says she knew this person or that person. Very equivocal, but it fell apart fairly quickly later in the year uh, when uh, a group of people in Chicago said, uh, who had known her as a young girl, said she'd been exposed to stuff that she's just repeating now, whether it's unconsciously or consciously, it doesn't matter. But if you look at that episode, it's very interesting <laughs> because she begins to understand that she's reincarnated because she is put into a, a hypnotist, hypnotic trance by a guy. And that hypnotic trance is what opens up. So it's just like A.J. Davis, but it draws into reincarnation. Davis, uh, I don't think, at least in the early years, I don't think he was ever uh, thinking that reincarnation was a possibility, but plenty of other people did write about it fairly early on, and it became a central part for some people. Any chemical background, such as um, vitamin deficiencies, alcohol, opium? Uh, that's an interesting question, and it's hard to answer. There's some books in the period of time that you're looking at that relate, these are all dealing with theories of mind. Mm -hmm. If you're writing in the 1830s, 1840s, 18, even 1850s about someone like Rachel Baker or um, um, Springfield's name, Jane Ryder, if you're writing about them, you're thinking about how does the mind function that it does this kind of thing? It's an interesting thing. And so you'll see books like Briere de Boismont on hallucinations and they'll draw into induced states of trance or induced states of alternate mind states like alcohol or drugs, opium especially, or natural trance states or induced trance states, all three. So you might fall into a coma or a trance, you might be put into a trance, or you might drink or imbibe some substance in between the trance. And those are all ways of thinking about how the mind functions. So that's all background to what you see here. Uh, some of the mediums definitely are accused when they're attacked. Many of them are accused of being alcoholics. And from a spiritual perspective, they often defended them saying, you know, the vehicle for communicating the spiritual truths is not always the strongest person in the room, often it's the weakest. And they're the ones who are most susceptible to the spirit message and the ones who receive it. So it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise if you're a spiritualist to say your medium is a, is a drunk because she might be a drunk, but that's what opens her up to communication. So there is a connection there, but it's not a, an easy connection. Did you have an experience that made you inter interested in this? I, I, when I started the book, I come from a scientific background, mm -hmm. and uh, my 
parents are both scientifically trained and my grandparents. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't start this anything. And in fact, what I said at the very beginning was I was not going to ask whether anything was true or false. What I was going to do was just look at what people said and what people experienced and how they wrote about it. That was my task. And I've stuck to that to this day. But I can say it was very interesting that after finishing the book, uh, definitely after, uh, my wife and I were driving through western New York State and there's a spirit community like Lake Pleasant called Lilydale out there. And I had been to Lilydale once before to look around. I didn't know it well, but I knew a little bit about where things were. And we drove in and we just on a whim we said, let's stop off. We've been driving all day. In the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, we drove in. 1.50, we drove in. And at the gate, they handed you uh, a list of things that you can do for the day. And I looked down and it says, 2 o'clock, there's a spirit service. I said, I haven't been to an actual spirit service, let's go. So we, we walked in, we sat in the back, there were about 30 people in the crowd, and three people up on the stage. And the first one gets up the MC, I'll call her, uh, and she says, well, I welcome you all to the spirit service for today. Uh, we have so-and-so who's going to be your minister, and so-and-so who's going to be your clairvoyant. And uh, there was a little organ playing, like in a Protestant service and a little cheesy stuff. The minister got up and gave a very cheesy sermon. There wasn't very much. I don't mean to denigrate, but it wasn't particularly inspiring. Then the clairvoyant got up, and the clairvoyant said, there are a lot of spirits in the room today. I want to tell you that if I see a spirit next to you, I will ask you, may I approach you? And you should say yes or no in a clear voice so I can make the connection more strong. Don't, you know, just yes or no. That's all I want to hear. So she looks at somebody and says, may I approach you? Yes. Says, I see an older man over your right shoulder with gray hair, clipped short, he cares about you. He says, sound familiar? That's my grandfather. No, don't just say yes or no. <laughs> but, you know, people, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, okay, I'm very, you know, prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is kind of hokey. <laughs> she goes to another one and says, may I approach you? Yes. <clears throat> I see a woman standing behind you in the kitchen, a short, dark-haired lady banging a lot of pots and pans, always making noise. This makes sense. Yes. She's Italian. Yes. She's like, your grandmother. Yes. I thought, well, that's, that's more interesting. She goes, another, may I approach you? Yes. I see a man whose right leg is about three inches shorter than his left leg. He walks with a very pronounced limp, but doesn't use a cane. This, yes. That's my uncle. Shh, just say yes, sir. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and some people are resisting, some people are going with it, some people are uh, really quite moved by the experience. And she's winding up, she looks at me and she says, may I approach you? <laughs> I say, no, I'm the dispassionate <laughs> But I said, yes. And she said, I don't understand, but I see two people over your shoulder. Is your grandfather in the spirit world? And I say, yes, he is. And I'm Robert S. Cox the sixth. My grandfather is the fourth. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, oh, that's interesting. So I don't know who the other guy is, but he's right on your grandfather's shoulder, just like your grandfather's right on your shoulder. Oh, that's very interesting. So your grandfather describes you at work, and he says, you, you're in a, a room, a, a square room, with counters all around and cupboards above, and books, and manuscripts all over it. I was a manuscript curator at the time. Oh. And I thought, <laughs> and then he goes and delivers a message and, and uh, describes actually my office perfectly, very succinctly, but very perfectly. And the use of the word manuscript was odd. And then she, she gave some message, you know, saying, you know, your grandfather says, you know, you're having a difficulty at work, which I always do. It's always a pain. <laughs> okay. And says, you know, but it'll get better in the fall. Things will change, yada, yada, yada. She says, I don't understand this at all. But your grandfather also describes something that seems completely unrelated. But it shows you up on a stage under the podium with a blue aura around your throat, speaking to large groups of people. Does this make sense? And at the time, I was teaching a course with 300 students every term, and I always up on a stage at the podium with 300 students in front of me. I thought, wow, that's funny. You know, that's weird. And she says, that's it. <laughs> and so she finished up, and, and Rachel turned to me, and she says, do you want to go talk to her? And I said, no. She said, neither do I. <laughs> so... What I can say is it's interesting when you're in that position because I had been very, you know, I, I, I still to this day draw no judgment. It doesn't matter to me 
whether someone believes it, whether it's true, whether someone doesn't believe it, someone said false, I get irritated when I see skeptics who are using as logic as faulty as they claim the believers use. But other than that, that unfairness of that, that I see often do, delivered to these people, because I know a lot of people who believe wholeheartedly in this, what I can say is if, if you're put in that position and you receive a message like that, it's intriguing and you can't help but sort of get into the mood of thinking, how is this? Is this real? What is this? And I just shut that out. I just don't deal with it. I've been one other time when a spirit medium came to me, delivered a message that made zero sense whatsoever with anything in my life. And she insisted it was real and insisted it was for me. And, you know, again, you, you do there. And I, I've gotten from that a little bit of a sense of what it's like for a believer to get a message that doesn't compute, that doesn't work for them, and how disappointing that is for them. So, I, uh, you know, what I'm ultimately interested in is sort of the intellectual and emotional architecture of people who go, what the people in the crowd feel when somebody delivers a message to them, and what people who are trying at home, you know, with a Ouija board or with a, a spirit circle or whatever they're doing, depending on what period of time, and what they think they're getting out of it. And for me, it's, a, it's this really beautiful philosophy before the Civil War of people believing that we have social connections that are innate and they just have to be acted upon to, to, to overcome problems. And it, it's a beautiful thing. And spirituals do some amazing things in that period of time. And then it gets gutted right out from under them because of the problems that we have in this country of race. And that's a sad thing. It, is it not back currently? It, it has come and gone. And so it, it dropped down, and then after the first world, actually before and after the first world war, it comes back up, drops down a little bit, comes back a little bit after the second world war, and then you have that new age thing in the 17, 1960s, which is not unrelated, it's not identical, but not unrelated. And uh, that caused a boost, and there is, in the last maybe 10 years, another little boost. And it is, if you look at it, it's similar but not identical. I spoke to a group of spirit mediums at one time, uh, which was like frightening to me. Uh, first, they could read my mind. But secondly, <laughs> I was worried that they'd be offended at what I was saying. And they weren't at all. And in fact, when I started talking to them one-on-one -on -one especially, I realized that a lot of what I was describing in the 1850s, they still felt was valid. They still felt was real. They didn't use the same terms always. But they could see, you know, sort of like, someone speaking, speaking to you in a language that you half understand, using slightly different words, slightly different syntax, but you kind of get the, the gist. And that's the way I felt talking to them, is that you know, we were on the same plane, even though we were sometimes using slightly different words. So it is still, it is back to being popular. It was, has been all over television, ghosts and all this kind of stuff, which are, again, tied into this, are very popular again. But it, it has done this cyclically through time. In your research into uh, the post-World War II period, mm -hmm. does the U.S. government recognize spiritualism as a church? Mm -hmm. A church doesn't need to be a Section 501c3 nonprofit corporation or automatically is. Does the U.S. government, through its Department of Treasury and Internal Revenue Service, recognize as a religion spiritualism groups? There are a couple of spiritual churches. There's the National Spiritualist Association of Churches and then the National Spiritual Alliance. There's a couple of spirit bodies, and I believe they are registered churches and recognized. Uh, I've tried to go through the censuses to try to see if uh, they get reported in the federal censuses, and, and they do under other. Right? So it's, I don't know what the tax status is, but they are officially churches as far as I know. And, uh, but not all spiritualists are members of churches. Many spiritualists felt that the spirit communication that they believed in, that this communication was true, but it had nothing to do with religion. Uh, it was a natural phenomenon. And, you know, sympathy is natural, death is natural, all we're doing is acting upon that. Religion is a separate issue. Uh, there were others who felt that it was anti Christian, and there were others who felt that it was hyper Christian, super Christian. So you see spiritualists who are parts of Unitarian churches or part of other churches that would allow some doctrinal flexibility. And you'll see churches who form 
around spiritual ideas like national spirit national alliance of sorry the national spiritual alliance or the national spiritual association of churches so there's all sorts of complications to it were these people offended when uh, johnny carson used to do Parnet? offended probably not uh i mean maybe some might be but for the most part i think like when a new hall they're so used to being questioned that it's it's maybe annoying, uh, but they're they're used to being questioned. When I've found sensitivities, it's usually and I I avoid living people, by the way, uh, so I don't talk to as many living people <laughs> about this stuff as you would think. But when I found people being sensitive, it, it's often about the skeptics who come in, and what the the line is often if I can replicate the phenomena that you claim to be seeing. I know that what you're doing is false. And that's nonsense. If I can replicate the Mona Lisa, it doesn't mean the Mona Lisa is false. It means I've replicated something. It's a copy. Yeah, I've made a copy. And that copy may be totally different than the original. It just may look like the original. And skeptics produce you know, systems of logic that don't really work well with spirit logic. So it's it's... You know, I actually share the logic that the skeptics do to a certain degree, uh, you know, innately because of my, my, my background in the sciences, but at the same time, I look at them and say, you know, their house, they should get their house in order before they begin to talk about somebody else, in particular before they begin talking about fraudulence. Because I, I think if there's, if there's something that is not real, not an intersubjective reality of some sort, it comes out of probably people interpreting things in ways that they say is spirit when someone else would interpret it in other ways. But not fraud, not deceit. It's, it's simply a different way of looking at the same set of events and realities. Speaking of science, uh -huh. uh, modern day pe pe uh, cultural issues in science are pretty much pervasive in our, in our culture, oh, yeah. whether we like it or not. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious that, well, from two things. One is I've seen various accounts in science mm -hmm. of supporting these energy fields. Yep. And I'll call them that because that's what scientists sure. call them. And there are, there are people that measure various kinds of energy fields. Mm -hmm. um, I saw actually an exhibit, um, just because it was fascinating, of infrared yep. spectroscopy. And they claim to see the auras of people yep. around the infrared field mm -hmm. uh, that a human being has. Are, is spiritualism, modern day spiritualism, do you believe that the, the folks who really adhere to it, the medium or whoever it is, this clairvoyant that mm -hmm. you meet, do you feel that they are perhaps not accepting of the science or think it's not important? Or, or is there an integration in some areas? That you, I, because I see it as being a positive thing, but I don't know if that's important to the people who, who really believe From the beginning, spirits have latched onto scientific approaches. Did they? From the very beginning, and wow. still to this day. Great. And I actually think, strategically, it was a mistake. <laughs> because spirituals back in the day would say, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Quaker, right? And so if I start talking about inward light and all these other sort of central core concepts of Quakerism, um, people look at us and say, crazy. You really believe that stuff? And it's like, well, you know, I do in the sense that I'm a Quaker and Quakers believe this stuff. If spiritualists had just said that, mm -hmm. fine. But instead they laid out and they said, we are a scientific religion. We are the only ones where you can test yourself. We're empirical. You can come in, you can try it, you can get a communication from a spirit, you can decide is this real or is this not real. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of tests. They, they had actually mediums called test mediums. And, uh, and they would be put to the test to say, can you deliver a message that's meaningful? So people would quite typically go in, Houdini did, did a later version of this, but they would go in, they would have a secret message that they expect from, from a, a dead relative, and if that message were delivered, then it would prove it was real, if that message were not, it would prove it was false. And Houdini allegedly gave a message to his wife and saying, if, if I were to come back in a seance, I will deliver these words, and that has not happened, and all that. That no more proves or disproves anything, but that approach the spirituals had to saying we operate on scientific principles has put them always on their heels because mm. scientists come along and say that's not scientific or that is scientific. 
and the post World War II period is interesting because uh, I shouldn't point to you necessarily, uh, but <laughs> but the post World War II period is very interesting because that's the rise of modern psychic science with uh, the Ryan Institute testing ESP and all these other things, which are central to spirit beliefs in the 19th century and the 20th century. And so you had endowed departments of, of parapsychology in the University of Virginia at Duke that investigated these things. And those centers are still sort of around in one form or another, but they've been sort of shunted to the side. But they were using what they thought was high science to address this. And they have generally not succeeded at doing that. There are scientific indications, if you read these journals and so forth, that certain things are happening, but they're not strong enough to explain everything spiritual say. And I think spiritualists made the mistake, it, mistake is the wrong way to put it, but it was unfortunate that they went the path they did because everything has been predicated on this belief that you could test it and show it to be demonstrably true as opposed to simply taking it on faith. So that's, so we lost out for two reasons. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Thanks for having me.